So in this video, I want to talk about some other topics about the natural history of the Earth or evolutionary process that are very important to learn about and that we've kind of mentioned in other lecture series, but not really focused, but not really. The first is the idea of adaptive radiation. When we talked about mass extinctions, I talked about the fact that after mass extinctions, a lot of niches will open up within the ecosystems, allowing the evolution of new organisms to fulfill those roles, which is partially the reason why there's an overall pattern for increasing biodiversity throughout the history of the Earth, because these events have forced, because these events have forced new kinds and a great branching in the tree of life. Now, of course, extinctions always trim the branches and make the life diversity go down, but overall you end up with different kinds of branches when it's all said and done because of these adaptive radiation events, such as the one that happened with the mammals. After the extinction of the dinosaurs about 65 million years ago, a lot of the mammals evolved and created a great adaption event. Look at this. This is the adaptation that happened between 65 million years ago and 45 million years ago, and an explosion in the adaptation that existed in the mammals because the dinosaurs going extinct open up all those niches. You see similar adaptive radiation events when organisms colonize a new area of the world. For example, when the finches colonized the Galapagos Islands and they had no other competitors there, uh, they also adaptive radiated to the different environments that they saw there. So adaptive radiation is something that you see past mass extinctions. You also see when organisms go to different kinds of environments and colonize different environments and all these kinds of things. So adaptive radiation is based on that concept of speciation, which what is one species can split into different species if they're isolated and then if different things happen to each of the isolated populations as you saw happening in the Galapagos Islands with the finches which experienced different environments where they had to eat different foods now you can also reverse this back in time and start to realize that if indeed a species can come from another species then that means that that species may also have come from another species and so forth and you keep going backwards in time you realize that all species descend from other species with modification and that therefore all species on earth share a common ancestry and come from the same original species that share the origin of life at the beginning which is why you have this convoluted tree of life that you see down in the bottom left and it means basically that life has been splitting since the very beginning through successive adaptive radiation events now just so you know the largest adaptive radiation event ever was during the Cambrian explosion was during the Cam uh, the first uh, eon of the earth's history and that's when you saw the evolution of all kinds of life including like plants animals you know um, fungus you saw the evolution of several different classes and orders of plants, animals, and fungus. So it is the evolution that created the most different types of life. Since then, of course, there's been several different adaptive radiation events at the global scale. For example, like the memo adaptive radiation at the end of the dinosaurs, the adaptive radiation at the beginning of the Triassic, which led to the formation of several different dinosaur families, and so forth. Another big adaptive radiation happened also at during the, the, the Triassic and Jurassic and Cretaceous period, which is the plant life adaptive radiation with when the flowering plants evolved. And a great explosion in plant diversity took place because of the advantage of flowering plants and speeding up the sexual reproductive process. But all of these things are what we call adaptive radiation. Great speciation events which causes great splits on the tree of life, usually because of evolvability of niches, either because of mass extinctions or because of colonization of un uncolonized habitats. Now, another one of these important concepts in evolution is the idea of co-evolution. The idea that some organisms in nature evolve so close together because they have such close relationships relationships that they must have evolved as a unit. For example, pollinators and the ones that rely on them, which are, you know, uh, flowering plants. A lot of flowering plants uh, originally did not have to rely on the pollinators, but once they actually had the pollinators, that became such a big advantage because instead of relying only in the wind to, tra to transfer the pollen from, from plant to plant, they could now rely on something that's going to go to the flower and will go to a different flower in, in, in the process of eating, and because of that, it will carry uh, the pollen with them. And that's why the flowers are colorful and attractive because they're trying to call the pollinators to come towards them. So and it's also why the pollinators develop things like, you know, for example, the hummingbird will tend to, you know, hover near the flower so it can drink from the flower and things like that. So all of these different things are examples of structures and that evolve or behaviors that evolve in close unit because of the symbiotic relationships that end up evolving between the two of them. Likewise, there's always, you know, a win-lose kind of game with predators and prey. It's kind of like they're playing catch, they're playing tag. You know, first the predator becomes faster, but then the prey becomes either faster or smarter at the way that she runs around and the predator has to play catch up but then the play has to play catch up and so forth we talked about this when we talk about community ecology and the idea that predators is constantly putting pressure on prey to become better at escaping and preys are constantly putting pressure on predators to become better at attacking and capturing the prey so this game you know of, of tag is, is also an example of co-evolution where they both putting selective pressure on each other so the characteristics of predator and prey the characteristics of both part of the 
us in a symbiotic relationship. The characteristics of a host and its parasite. The parasite tries to develop better to, to, be, to do a better job at staying in the host and not being detected by the host and you know actually surviving the host for longer periods of time while meanwhile the host is trying to get the parasite out and again you have that tag relationship where they're putting pressure on each other. So all of these are examples of the way we talk about in co-evolution. That's very interesting in evolutionary biology when you take a higher level course on that in college and trying to understand how these relationships evolve in the first place. Now a lot of times, remember, uh, you can think of it this as a reductively complex system. You know, how can the hummingbird even exist without the flower? But how can the flower exist without the hummingbird? You know, when you have these symbiotic relationships, you ask yourself, how could you possibly have one thing without the other? Well, clearly what's happening here is that obviously the hummingbird was not originally relying on the flower, but it, the ancestor of the hummingbird was completely different and did not rely on the flowers. But one bird that had a mutation that made it uh, do or have some sort of reliance on a flower survived better than others because that was an unexplored niche. And that led to the formation of that relationship where the hummingbird went to the flower. Meanwhile, flowers which are adapted to the hummingbirds also became, have an advantage. So you can see how this is something that can uh, develop little by little. Even though now it seems to be complex, you have to remember that in the beginning it was not. And this is actually a perfect example of something of that's a mosaic. You have two separate systems which combine together at some point in the evolutionary process to form a new kind of structure. In this case, is a community college structure. But co-evolution is an example of evolutionary topics that we talk about at the community level, which is because evolution is usually talked about in a population level. But remember, competition, um, predator-prey relationships, symbiosis, and other kinds of community interactions are also going to be crucial for the evolutionary process. And remember, of course, that the environment changes are also going to be important for evolutionary process, which leads us to another topic that's important for evolution, which is the idea of spatial distribution patterns, which we learned when we talked about evidence for evolution, and we talked about biogeography. Different organisms live in different places of the world, and it seems as if organisms that have the same similar environments end up developing similar features. We've talked about this as analogous structures. And there also have organisms that live in different environments, and even though they share common ancestors and have a a lot of similar structures which are called homologous structures they are somewhat different from each other because the pressure on the different environments was different so this is an example of how changes in ecosystem across space and time led to differentiation in formation of the species and spatial patterns of diversity that we call biogeography studies this. And I talk about already several examples of this throughout the evolutionary lecture series uh, unit. We talked about the finches, we talked about you know the tortoises, about uh, reptiles, about you know the families that you see in the bottom there with the anteater, armadillo, and, and the pangolins. All of these are examples of evolutionary diversity matching the environments so again changes in the environment but changes the pressure which therefore changes the cell natural selection process and therefore makes changes within populations that if isolated for long periods of time will lead to speciation uh, events now one thing that's actually very important to talk about is that any of these changes in the evolutionary process will actually take a very very long time and that is the key about evolution that it you can't really understand the evolution normally does not make large leaps now remember you do still have punctuated equilibrium when there's extremely strong selection or then when there is you know a very very sudden genetic drift or something like that but in general the whole process of evolution for us to go from an ancestor that was monkey like to something that looks like the way it looks today is actually um, takes a very very long period of time so what it happens in the evolution process is that small changes over long periods of time equals large changes in a species so uh, the difference between one species and another is usually very very small but then each of these species will change into another, into another, into another, until you finally can't even recognize what you're looking at compared to where it started from. Look, for example, at the evolution of horses that you see in this picture over here. As the environments changed between the Eocene and the recent environments, and grasslands became more common around the world, changes occur in the environment uh, in, in the horses. Bones, the cranial structures, the digestive lining, the height of the horses, all different things responding to change the environment. Locking knees so they can stand up for longer periods of time. Changes in the epithelial tissue of their, of their stomach so they can absorb different kinds of food. The height because the grass height also changes so they also have to change their heights to get through it. All of these different things 
are, are examples as, as the environment progressively changes, the organisms also progressively change. And remember that in biogeography, you see the same patterns across space today. We call that cline, when organisms go from one ecosystem to a similar, to a similar, to a similar, and steadily, especially when you see mountains, and as you go up the mountain, you see slightly different organisms living in higher and higher altitudes. The same thing you see across space and time. So with the horses, for example. But you don't go from the horse that you have today, which is the Equus, from the original horse, the or very ancient horse, like that. It's a process that takes millions and millions of years. In this case, 55 million years. So it was small, steady changes over long periods of time. Another thing that you may notice here is that although there seems to be a trend, as you see on the left side, for the horse to become larger, for it to be developed knees, for, for that lock, and all these trends that you see is seen to have trends, I want to remind you, and that's what you see when you look at the right side or in the center, that what you're looking at is only the trends that survive. But that life also attempted many other types of life, and there was other branches that didn't make it. And those other branches, those other species, then get, went extinct. And so that branch ceased to continue to change. So while one branch may have gradually changed, you're forgetting that what actually is happening is this adaptive radiation. But it's just that the ones that didn't make it, those branches of the tree of life got pruned, got cut. They went extinct because they could not cope with the environmental changes, either because the changes were too sudden or because the population the randomness of never having developed a mutation that actually helped them out with the changes in the environment, or when the environment changed, there was not already someone in the population that had the changes that necessary. Because remember, that's the thing about evolution. You don't have to develop the mutation when the environment changes. Usually, there's already variety within the, the, the population which allows the organisms to survive a little environment change because the mutation already happened a long time ago, but it was either neutral or masked by some other process allowing the mutation to be preserved in the population until there was a time where it was actually necessary and that was the key that allowed the species to survive. But if other populations did not have such mutations, they go extinct if there is a sudden environmental change. So what you're seeing here is a gradual process of gathering mutations and some of those mutations would be neutral at first until the environment changes and then they become beneficial. But remember, also when we talk about the way that works at the genes, that sometimes you have multiple copies and you still have the original gene plus the variant plus another variant. So you have different abilities within the organism allowing to survive more situations, to, have a, to expand its fundamental niche. But if the niche was not expanded enough and the environment changed too fast, that branch of the tree of life went extinct and that isolated population did not survive and so over long periods of time what you see is only one trend one path that seems to be gradually changing towards a certain look but it's not like that and what you actually have is many branches of the tree of life you see the thing, thing, same thing with the human evolution patterns although there's a pattern or it seems to be a pattern for you to have you know um, larger brain size, for you to have a higher developed size, for you to have a, a more, uh, more smart, there's more complexity. All of these things, it, there's not a trend for evolution. What you're seeing here is that, we talked about this when the microevolution, what you're seeing is the fact that the pressure has never changed. The pressure for higher size has always been there, and that's why we keep going towards that look, because the pressure has been constant for 55 million years. But if the pressure were to change, the situation would change. And also remember that because we descend with modification from our ancestors, we have shared common ancestry, we are carrying the baggage of our ancestors with us, which puts what we call evolutionary constraints on the future generations. We can never be perfect at anything because we are always modified versions of whatever came before. So at best, we're going to be the best we can be based on an adaptation of what existed before, which means what evolution creates is always going to be suboptimal structures to solve particular problems. And remember, you're not actually just responding to the environment. We're not, the environment is not asking for something. The population is saying, I'm choosing to be like this. It is a random process of mutations that happens. Many of them are disadvantageous, but some of them may be advantageous. And randomly, sometimes it happens, sometimes it don't. But when the random mutations provide an advantage, that will lead to more variety. But always, sub-ultimately, because you're descending with modification. And if there is any trend towards perfection, it is purely accidental because... There is a constant pressure to, to look at a certain way. But that doesn't mean it's becoming more perfect. It only, because remember, perfect doesn't make sense since as the environment changes, the pressure also changes. And that's why 
over a long period of time. Life changes through adaptive radiation, spatial patterns across space and time, coevolution, gradual small changes. Throughout the time, as the Earth has changes, sudden changes we call punctual equilibrium, and gradual changes, which we call gradualism, will accumulate, and the adaptive radiation process will repeat over and over again until you end up with all the variety that you see in life today.